fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. I'm Ben Wilcox, and I am so grateful that you've decided to spend some time in the scriptures with me today. I want you to know how much I appreciate all of you as my audience, especially those of you who have studied and learned with me for so long now. I see you as my fellow teachers and students, and I want you to know that each of you gives meaning and fulfillment to the efforts that I make each week to put these together. So I just wanted to say thank you. And today, we'll be covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 14 through 17. My goal with these lessons is to not only give you insights into the scriptures, but also provide you with ideas and materials to help you teach those insights to other people in relevant and meaningful ways. And if you find this video helpful, please consider subscribing and sharing it with others. Now grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Now some of you in your study may have noticed something interesting about the beginning of a number of these early sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. And to illustrate this, I like to call on four different students to read the first five verses of the following sections, 6, 11, 12, and 14. But here's the catch. I want them all to read those verses out loud at the same time for everybody else to hear. And I tell the readers not to worry about what the others are saying, but just to continue reading no matter what. And for the rest of the class, even though the readers are reading from four different sections, try to pay attention to what all four are saying, as difficult as that sounds. Now, if they do that, you're going to notice something interesting. Everybody's expecting chaos, and that it's going to be impossible to understand what they're saying. But... The first five verses of each of these sections says the exact same thing. Now that might make some of you wonder why God would say the exact same thing four different times. Was Joseph just rubber stamping the beginning of each revelation? Are these vain repetitions? And I don't think so. When these revelations were first received, the Doctrine and Covenants didn't exist in the form that it is now. It wasn't until later that these four revelations were actually bound together and published as a book of revelations for the general membership of the church to read. So the key to understanding this is in who these revelations are addressed to. Oliver Cowdery, Hiram Smith, Joseph Knight Sr., and David Whitmer. Each is directed to a different man. So doesn't it make sense that God might have a similar message that he'd want to give to different individuals? Each one of these brethren is going to play some significant part in early church history. And I don't believe it cheapens the message for God to deliver the same message and inspiration to different players involved in the building up of Zion. God wanted Oliver and Hiram and David and Joseph Knight to know that a great and marvelous work was about to come forth, that the field was white, all ready to harvest, and that if they would be willing to ask, they could receive. If you want to see another example of this, do this activity next. Choose two students and ask one to read section 15 out loud, the entire section, and it's only six short verses, and another to read section 16 out loud at the same time. And what will they notice there? Besides the name of who the revelation is directed to, John Whitmer or Peter Whitmer, the revelation is the same, word for word. And once again, does that cheapen it? And I don't think so. The most wonderful word to focus on in those sections is the names. The fact that the Lord is speaking to them as individuals is what matters most. He knows them by name calls them by name, and delivers a message to them by name. And does it really matter if it's the same message? The difference that matters most is in the who, not the what. For example, I'm sure that the language of my mission call, besides my name and my assignment, was the same as others receiving mission calls. The instruction, the call to serve, the manner in which I should serve, those things are the same for all called to the work of God's service. But those instructions 
were to me and signed by the First Presidency. To have my name appear on the same page as theirs was very meaningful to me. So let's not get too hung up on the repeated language in some of these revelations. It's not vain repetition, but revelatory repetition. And some of you may have noticed that I haven't really focused much on those initial verses in these past couple of lessons. So I'd like to do a little bit of that here since we have the same language at the beginning of section 14. Now we've talked about the great and marvelous nature of God's work from section 4. And we've covered the ask and ye shall receive principle many times from verse 5. But I'd like to spend some time on these three verses in between, verses 2 through 4. And for an icebreaker here, I like to do an object lesson. Now there may be a bit of cost involved in this, but I've found that object lessons can be very effective. So ask your class, according to verses 2 through 4, what two objects do disciples of Christ hold in their hands? If, if you painted a picture of a disciple of Christ based on those verses, what would they be holding? And the answer is a two-edged sword in one hand and a sickle in the other. And then I like to pull these objects out. I have a real sword and a real sickle that I bring into class to show them. So, like I said, there's a little bit of cost involved here. Uh, right now, you can buy a sickle on Amazon for around $9. A sword is a little more expensive. I bought one years ago when I started teaching seminary, and I've used it for years. But I found what I feel is a decent one on Amazon for around $40. And I'll put links to those in the video description if you're interested. Another less expensive option would be to buy a plastic or a play sword. Although I found that a real sword has a bit more of an effect. And of course, you could always just show pictures of these objects as well. I just find that it's more interesting to the students if you actually have the items with you to display. But let's examine these symbols for just a minute because both of them are very significant. So first, the sword. What does it represent according to verse 2? It represents God's word. Now somebody may point out that it doesn't actually say that in the verse, that, that we have the sword, only that it represents God's word. But you can take them to section 27, verse 18, where you see the disciple of Christ wielding the sword of God's words in his hands. It's the section that talks about the armor of God. So yes, God places the sword of his word in our hands. And since we're already here in section 27, you can see the other thing that the sword symbolizes. Remember, it's a two-edged sword. So the fact that it symbolizes two things fits well. It's the sword of his word and the sword of the spirit. Now, why would he make that comparison? And this is a, a really fun discussion to have with your students. How is the Word of God, or the Spirit of God, like a sword? And then just let them brainstorm that for a while. A couple ideas. What do you use a sword for? Battle. As far as the Word of God is concerned, this is not the only object that God has used to symbolize it. Some of the other symbols for the Word of God in the Scriptures are an iron rod, a compass, a lamp, and bread, or manna. But I think the Lord chooses certain symbols at certain times based on the context. So which did he choose to emphasize here in the Doctrine and Covenants in the last days as we prepare for the second coming? A sword. Which suggests that life is like a what? It's a battle. Right now, the latter days are most like a battlefield. And if you don't have your sword, you may be defeated or spiritually slain. And we'll go into more detail on that battlefield of life when we get to section 27. And we'll talk about the whole armor of God. But the word of God is a sword. By the same token, there are a number of different symbols for the spirit in the scriptures. Fire. Wind, 
a dove, rain. But in the last days, what will the Spirit be needed for? To win our spiritual battles. So go back to section 14. He's going to give us some specific reasons for why his word is like a sword. He says it's quick and powerful. Interesting. There are many different kinds of swords out there. And what kind of a sword do you picture the word of God and the spirit being like? Is it one of those thin swords, like a rapier or a foil, that you might see in a fencing match? These are quick swords. Or is it a broad sword or a long sword, the kind you picture medieval knights using? These are powerful swords. The kind of sword that I purchased and use for object lessons in my classes is one of these kinds of swords. It's very heavy and long, and I can imagine that if you swung it hard, it could do some real damage. It's a powerful sword. But I can't imagine being able to fight with much quickness with that sword. Most swords are either one or the other. But the Word of God is the kind of sword that is both quick and powerful. If I had to choose a sword to symbolize it, I might choose the Roman short sword as the symbol. Perhaps the closest thing to a sword that is both quick and powerful. These swords were broad, but not as long. The reason for its design is that Roman legions often fought in tightly packed groups of soldiers where the combat was up close. And under those circumstances, it would be difficult to fight effectively swinging a large, long sword around. You would want something short that you could thrust with rather than, than swing so much. Interestingly enough, the first place we see this language about the sword comes from Paul in the New Testament. In Hebrews 4.12, he says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, Paul lived in a Roman world. Possibly, he had this sword in mind when he compared it to the word of God and the spirit. And is there a possible message in that? This fight with sin and evil and the adversary is hand-to-hand, -hand, close quarters combat. The adversary's attack is very personal and individualized. You're going to need a quick and powerful sword in order to defeat him. And section 14 also says that this sword cuts through things. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, to the dividing asunder of both joints and marrow. Joints and marrow are the toughest and deepest parts of the body. It would take a very powerful sword to cut through both joints and marrow. What's the symbolism in that? What does the sword of the Word of God and the Spirit cut through? It cuts through lies, maybe? Or perhaps the major suggestion is that it goes deep. It penetrates to the very center. The marrow of the bone is as deep as you can go. And maybe that's another helpful thing to consider as you learn to recognize the spirit. There's a depth to it. Some emotional and intellectual arguments out there are fairly shallow when presented. But there's a depth to truth taught by the Spirit and the Word of God. It sinks deep into your heart. Like Paul said in his version of this idea, it divides asunder both soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's depth. Right to the soul, to the bone, to the heart. That's where God's truth penetrates. So for example, the idea of God's grace and forgiveness is the kind of truth that penetrates deep. I am a child of a loving God is a truth that goes straight to the heart. Now, there's a number of places in the scriptures where sword words are used to describe the effect that the Spirit has on the heart. 
In some places, the scriptures say that people are cut to the heart. And it's usually used in a negative way. Laman and Lemuel and the Pharisees are cut to the heart by the influence of the truth and the Spirit. It's not comfortable, and so they fight back against it. It hurts. On the other hand, the word pierce is also used to describe the effect that the Spirit and the Word can have on people's hearts. And this is usually positive in nature. It did pierce them to the very center. That's the Spirit. It either cuts or pierces you. But it's the state of your heart that determines which. And hopefully, we are pierced by it. Now, the sickle. What does the sickle represent? Well, the sickle was a tool used for harvesting. And after the wheat is full grown, you cut it from the earth so that you can lay it up in store for the future. With the sword, the blade was used for fighting. With the sickle, the blade is used for gathering. It's a little more positive in nature. The exact symbolism for what the sickle itself represents isn't as clear as with the sword. Suppose the sickle could be our faith, our testimony, our desire. Let me know in the comments below if you have some insight for me there. But it is a question that could be pondered. But what about the wheat? What is it that we're gathering? I think we usually compare the wheat to people, to souls. We go out and we gather others to the fold. And we'll see this imagery come up again when we get to section 86, where the wheat and tares clearly represent people. But could there be other symbolism as well? What else does God want us to gather? Some of the other themes from these sections that could suggest the answer to that. He wants us to gather wisdom, good works, good desires, Christ-like attributes or character. And the symbol that it seems most to point to is salvation. It's salvation that is being gathered and treasured up. So as a missionary, I don't think I need to feel like a failure if I haven't brought many souls or sheaves unto him, although that imagery does work. I do want to gather souls to safety and salvation, but it's the effort that brings the salvation to my soul. In each of these cases, the field is white already and needs to be harvested. There's so much for us to gather. There's a lot of wisdom I can gain. There's a lot of character I need to develop. There are so many good works that I can do. There are souls to bless through proclaiming the gospel, redeeming the dead, and perfecting the saints. There is an abundance of salvation to reap. So go out there and thrust in your sickle. And that suggests really putting forth effort into the gathering. There's work to do, whether it's wisdom or good works or souls or character or salvation itself. I want to thrust in my sickle with my might. And once I have those things, I treasure them and hold them sacred and lay them up in store. So, some of the truths taught by these few verses here. If I faithfully wield the sword of the word and the spirit, I will conquer Satan. If I thrust in my sickle with my might, I will gather much. And to liken the scriptures, a few questions. How would you rank your level of swordsmanship? Novice, amateur, professional, or master? And how would you rank your level of sickleship? And how could you improve? As a disciple of Christ in the latter days, we fight and we gather. I've got my two blades accomplishing two very critical tasks. Another image that comes to my mind is the ancient Egyptian pharaohs that also held two symbolic things in their hands, the crook and the flail as symbols of their leadership. For latter-day disciples of Christ, we carry two things as well. And we hope that when we die, we can symbolically lay these two items across our chest. 
our sword that we've used valiantly to conquer and defend ourselves against Satan, and our sickle, well used in our efforts to gather throughout our lives. May their blades ever be sharp, and our skill in using them evident. Well, there's another verse I'd like to examine with you in section 14. And my icebreaker would be a pair and share activity. Pair up your students and have them share their answers to the following questions. What is the greatest birthday or Christmas gift that you've ever been given? And what made it so great? Well, just like good parents and friends, we believe in a Heavenly Father that also loves to give His children gifts. We have the gift of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, and the gift of His Son. But of all the gifts He can give us, there is one that stands out above the rest. According to section 14, what is the greatest gift that you can get from God? Can you find it? It's verse 7. <laughs> Eternal life is the greatest gift. And, and first of all, do you understand what that term means? This is a good opportunity to clarify some definitions in the minds of your students. There's a difference between immortality, eternal life, salvation, perdition, and exaltation. So let me attempt to explain these visually with the kingdoms here. Immortality is to live for eternity as a resurrected being. All who have lived on this earth will be immortal. They will receive a resurrected body regardless of what kingdom they receive or even if they go to outer darkness. Eternal life, on the other hand, although that sounds synonymous, means to live forever with God. And eternal life can only be found within the celestial kingdom. Salvation is to be saved in a kingdom of glory. So whether you're celestial, terrestrial, or telestial, you are a recipient of salvation. You have been saved from the power of the devil, and you inherit a kingdom of glory. There will be those, however, that choose to reject salvation and instead inherit outer darkness, or perdition, which is a word that means to be lost. They join the devil in that third of the hosts of heaven that rebelled in the pre-mortal world in their own place. But then exaltation can only come to those who inherit a celestial glory. Well, with that in mind, the Lord says here in section 14 that exaltation or eternal life is the greatest gift that we can receive. And is he right? And if so, why? And I once had a rather outspoken student one year who raised her hand and said, you know, I don't think I want to go to heaven. It sounds boring. And a little shocked, I said, what on earth do you mean? Well, isn't it just like church all the time and clouds and singing? And you see, I believe her problem was that she had more of a cartoon sense of heaven. You know, angels sitting on clouds and strumming harps for eternity. That's not really the description that the scriptures give us. So I tried to give her a more expansive understanding of eternal life and to help her to see why heaven would not be boring and that it would be worth any effort to qualify for it. And what would you have said to convince her? With more preparation than I had at that moment, maybe I would have shown her this list of references. I call it, and my soul did long to be there. That's something that Alma the Younger said after he had a vision of the Celestial Kingdom in Alma 36. This is a cross-reference activity for your students. I've gone through the scriptures and pulled out some of my favorite descriptions of exaltation and why it is such a great gift. Why he would say that in verse 7. So send your students in to read as many as they can, and you could do this as a handout, and be prepared to share what they teach them about celestial glory. And let's dig into each one briefly in turn. 
So section 7689. Now you may wonder why the first verse on this list is a verse describing the telestial kingdom. Why would I do that? Well, what does that verse reveal about the telestial kingdom? The telestial kingdom surpasses all mortal understanding. It's so wonderful that we can't even comprehend it. Now, if the telestial surpasses all understanding, what does that say about the celestial? Remember, the symbol for the glory of the telestial kingdom is the stars and the amount of light that they shed on the earth, which isn't much. It's still pretty dark outside when only the stars are shining but they do provide some light. Well, how much brighter than the stars is the sun? That's how much more glorious the celestial kingdom is than the telestial. The glory of the celestial kingdom surpasses that surpassing of all understanding. It's worth it. Enos 127. There are loads of wonderful promises in that verse, but one word stands out to me most here. Rest. Celestial glory is rest. I don't think it means that it's an eternal vacation. Work and worship and learning will all be a part of the eternal world. But we will rest from temptation. We will rest from pain. We will rest from adversity. It's worth it. Mosiah 2.41. Another quality of heaven? Happiness. The celestial kingdom is a place of never-ending happiness. And though the line, and they lived happily ever after, may not be realistic in this life, it's completely realistic in the next. It's worth it. Helaman 3.30 Two things here. We get to meet former prophets. Have you ever wanted to meet Nephi, or Moses, or Joseph Smith, or Peter? or Abraham, or Brigham Young, or Paul, or Samuel the Lamanite? You get to in the celestial kingdom. And won't that be amazing? You'll rub shoulders and have conversations and mingle with the faithful men and women of the past. It's worth it. And I also love the phrase, to go no more out. I think that suggests that the test is over. You aren't going to have to face the test of mortality anymore. It will be finished, and you will have that sweet sense of accomplishment that you passed. Like the way you feel when your final, final is over. I remember the way that I felt when I completed my last test of my last college class for my master's degree. And at that point, I decided that I had no interest in pursuing a doctorate. My formal education was done. Now, I love learning and education and I plan to continue that throughout my life. But formal schooling was over. I was grateful for what I had learned and proud of the accomplishment. But I was done to go no more out. No more finals, no more homework, no more assignments, no more lectures. And it felt amazing. I think that's probably just a small taste of what it's going to be like to pass the formal education of mortality to pass the final judgment and enjoy the fruits of your celestial scholarship. It's worth it. Revelation 21.4, and I know you've heard me share this one before. It's one of my favorite verses of all time. What makes heaven so wonderful? There is so much hope and tenderness in this description. He wipes away our tears like a loving parent would do for their child. This life certainly has more than its fair share of ugliness and pain and sorrow. And some suffer far more than others do. But God will make all things right in the end for the righteous. All the things that cause tears, sin, death, suffering at the agency of others, physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, will be wiped away. It's worth it. Doctrine and Covenants 101, verses 32 to 34. One of the great blessings of exaltation is knowledge. There are so many questions that I have, and I'm sure you do as well. Christ is going to reveal those things. For example, I know one question that I want to ask. When I was a boy, I loved dinosaurs. They captured my imagination and my love. 
And I was so sure that I was going to become a paleontologist when I grew up. Well, when I meet the Savior in the next life, one of the things I want to ask him is, so how did the dinosaurs fit into your plan? And I'm sure he'll look at me and he'll say, oh, that's an easy one. Let me explain. Da -da 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 -da. And I'll say, oh, well, that makes sense. Thank you. I'm not sure why that bothered me so much in mortality. I imagine that most of our deepest philosophical, moral, and theological perplexities are going to be like that. So if there are things that you don't understand here, just hang on. The Lord promises that one day the faithful will understand all. It's worth it. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 92 to 95. Now, this is a deep one, and I don't feel comfortable in making too much commentary as to its meaning and application. But we will receive of his fullness and grace and be equal in some way in power and might and dominion to our Heavenly Father. And that's a promise that is so deep and massive that I believe it's one of those things that surpasses our current understanding. But it sure sounds sublime, doesn't it? As members of the Latter-day Church of Christ, we've been privileged to have this profound understanding of the true meaning of exaltation, eternal life, or heaven. That we can become like God in some way. The ins and the outs and the details of that promise, I don't dare speculate on. But I do know one thing. It will be worth it. The overall truth that I hope you've gotten from this exercise, eternal life is the greatest gift of God. It's worth it. It's more than worth it. As Paul powerfully said, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Any opposition, any trial, any sacrifice, any pain that you've experienced in mortality will be swallowed up in the glory of eternal life. This is but a small moment. And the instructions for meriting that gift is very simply put in verse 7. Keep my commandments and endure to the end. That's got to be our quest. That's our vision. That's our mortal mission. And I testify that eternal life lies at the end of that quest. A final discussion question as your class looks over their list. Which aspect of eternal life do you most look forward to and why? Now there's another aspect of heaven that I've saved for last year. One of the greatest ones. And it comes from a line that we find in both sections 15 and 16. So this is just a brief insight and activity here. And the icebreaker is simple. It's a question. According to statistics, what's the most popular answer people in the United States gave to the question, what are you most grateful for? And let your students make some guesses. Is it money, freedom, health? No. Nope. Family. Family was the overwhelming top answer. Friends also appeared at the top of the list as well. Apparently, what is it that we are most grateful for in this life? Other people. Generally speaking, relationships are what we most value as a society. And with that in mind, from our previous reading, you know that these two sections are directed to the two Whitmer brothers. They both wanted to know something. So I have two questions for you to look for. What was it that they wanted to know, and what was their answer? They wanted to know what would be of the most worth to them, which is a really great question to ask. <laughs> what is the most worthwhile thing that I can do with my time? And the answer they got was to bring souls unto Christ. That was the most worthwhile thing that they could do with their time. It reminds me of John's desire back in section 7. There was a man who understood that principle. He understood it so well that he desired to engage in that work for thousands of years. And 
That stands true with us too. Bringing souls to Christ will be the activity that will be of most worth to us. And I believe that applies to more than just missionary work. It's any work that you do that involves helping people come closer to Christ. It's helping your spouse come to Christ. It's helping your children come to Christ as a parent. It's helping your brothers and sisters come to Christ as a sibling. It's helping your students come to Christ as a teacher and helping the dead to come to Christ through temple work. It's helping your co-workers and neighbors and ministering families and communities to come into Christ. But the line that intrigues me most is the one that follows, where the Lord explains why it will be of most worth. The promise of that work is that you may rest with them in the kingdom of my Father. And that idea is going to come up again in section 18. And there it says, and if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be, one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. Again, the promise is there. It will be of most worth because we will have joy with them in the celestial glory. And we'll explore that idea a little more deeply next week in section 18. But the point is this. You can't talk about celestial glory and ignore this most important of aspects. Yes, it's true. Heaven is a place. And we just covered some of the great things about that place. But more importantly, heaven is people. People more than place. It's relationships. Husbands and wives, parents and children, brothers and sisters, man and God. That's got to be the most glorious aspect of exaltation, to spend eternity with the people that we love. And I like how Doctrine and Covenants 130 verse 2 puts it. And that same sociality which exists among us here will exist among us there. Only it will be coupled with eternal glory, which glory we do not now enjoy. And now can you see why we have so much of an emphasis on family in the church and strong marriages and sealing and unity? God knows what's going to be the most worth to us. That's why I've got to work so hard to bring others to Christ. I want them there with me. From my perspective, if my wife isn't there, it won't be heaven to me. I want my children there, my parents, my brothers and sisters, my grandparents, my ancestors, my ward members, all the students that I've taught. I want them there with me to find rest and joy with them. Our relationships will be of most worth to us. Adam and Eve are a good example of that principle. When Adam was given the choice between paradise and a person, Adam chose the person. He chose Eve over Eden because he knew that that relationship was of the most worth in that circumstance. So another truth that perhaps we could add to our previous principle, heaven is more than a place, it's people. Well, one final lesson to look at for section 17. I begin with this object lesson. I pull out a four by six note card and I tell them that I am able to cut a hole in this piece of paper big enough to fit my entire body through. And then I ask, who believes me? And some of the kids will usually raise their hands. And then I ask, of those with their hands up, how many of you believe I can do it because you've seen it done before and you know that it's possible. Many of the hands go down, but sometimes some remain up. Usually there are one or two students who have seen it done before. If not, then I say that I guess that I'm the only one that's really in that group then. And then I ask, who thinks that there is no possible way that it can be done and I'm just trying to trick you and these other believers are going to feel really foolish in a moment when I reveal that I was lying? And another group raises their hands. I then explain that those in the first group represent knowledge. They have a knowledge that what I'm saying is true. 
they can act as witnesses of that truth. Those in the last group represent doubt, since they don't believe me at all and think that I'm trying to fool them. But the most fascinating group out there to me are those of you who believe me, but you just don't have any idea of how I can do it. You just trust me that I'm telling the truth. Or you believe because there are other people in the room that say that they have seen it and that they know. What would we call that middle group? That's faith. Believing without seeing. Well, Joseph Smith also made a claim that was very difficult for many people to believe. He told them that he had translated an ancient book from golden plates, but that he was not allowed to show them to everybody. And that was very hard for a lot of people to accept. They said things like, we'll believe you if you'll just show us. Seeing is believing. But that's not how God works, is it? Let's see how he orders things. Sometimes to help my students learn how to study their scriptures a little more closely, I do a little activity called dig and draw with them. There's no teams, just the class competing against itself. And I tell them that there'll be a treat, or we'll watch a Studio C video, or there'll be some kind of reward if they can collectively, as a class, earn at least 80% of the possible points. And I tell them to read a certain section of scriptures, in this case, section 17, and be prepared to answer questions about it. The catch is that once I start asking the questions, they have to close their scriptures and answer from memory. And this really encourages them to read their scriptures carefully and with focus, which they're not always used to doing. And as the teacher, you should have either an individual card or a popsicle stick or a piece of paper with each of their names written on them. And you ask them a question and draw one of their names. If the person you draw can answer the question correctly without looking in their scriptures, then the entire class earns two out of two points. If they can't answer or they get it wrong, then you ask if there is anyone in the class who knows the right answer. Call on somebody with their hand up, and if they got it right, then the entire class earns one out of two points. If that person answers incorrectly or nobody knows the answer, then they earn zero. That's the dig portion of the activity. Then every three or four questions, we do a draw round. And for this, you select a name and have that person come forward to be the artist. You show them a word that comes from the section. Then it's like Pictionary. They've got to get the class to guess the word by drawing only pictures. No words, no speaking. If the class can guess it in 20 seconds or less, they earn two out of two points. If they can guess it in 40 seconds or less, they earn one out of two points. And if they can't guess it in 40 seconds, you reveal the word and they get zero. It's a really fun way to engage your class and it helps train them to read the scriptures more carefully. And we obviously can't do this activity on a video, but if you'd like, go ahead and study section seven, then close your scriptures and see if you can answer these questions. Maybe this will help you to see how clearly and closely you study the scriptures. So question one. Can you name the other four objects the three witnesses saw besides the gold plates? Answer, the Urim and Thummim, Moroni's breastplate, the Sword of Laban, and the Leahon. Question two, fill in the blank, and it is by your blank that you shall obtain a view of them, even by that blank which was had by the prophets of old. And the blanks are the same word. The answer is faith. Question three, what were the witnesses specifically instructed to do after they had seen the plates? Answer, to testify of them. Question four, fill in the blank. And this you shall do that my servant Joseph Smith Jr. may not be destroyed, that I may bring forth my righteous blanks unto the children of men in this work. Answer, purposes. Question five, the Lord said that the three witnesses had received three of the same things as Joseph had. Can you name at least two of those same things? Answer, the same power, the same faith, and the same gift. Question six, can you name one of the blessings God promised the three witnesses if they followed these commandments? Answer, there were three of them. 
They were promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against them, that the Lord's grace would be sufficient for them, and that they would be lifted up at the last day. Question 7. How many verses were in this section? The answer is 9. And question 8. What was the last word of the section? The answer, amen. So for the draw rounds, here are some possible words that you could choose. And I've got them divided up into easy, medium, and difficult, depending on the age of your class. Now that activity should give them a really good grasp of the major thrust of the section, and it sets you up to have a little discussion with them. And to get that discussion going, ask them to arrange the following three words in the order that God would place them, and to back up their answer with the verse of Scripture from section 17 that teaches that principle. And those three words are testify, believe, and see. Correct order is believe, see, testify. And the verse that most clearly teaches that principle is verse 3. And after that you have obtained faith and have seen them with your eyes, you shall testify of them by the power of God. A few questions to get the discussion going. First, why does God require faith and belief first? The world says that seeing leads to believing, but God says believing leads to seeing. Why? Why not just show us? I believe that part of the answer lies in the fact that faith requires conscious effort and that working for something is a divine principle. Satan is all about getting something for nothing. Cheating, lying, stealing, gambling. All examples of trying to get something for nothing. Simply showing someone something doesn't require much effort on their part and it usually doesn't motivate. Let me give you a quick example. I'm not sure it's the greatest example, but it works for me. And, and as I share it, be sure to listen with your spiritual ears. I'm an amateur magician, and when I do a really convincing trick, something that people just can't seem to explain rationally, it's like I've performed a minor miracle. Immediately following it, people will run up to ask me to show them how it's done. And they'll cajole and bribe and threaten and pressure me to tell them. But that pressure usually only lasts less than a minute. I can tell that they just want to instantly satisfy their curiosity. But do you want to know the big secret behind magic? The secrets aren't that hard to find, really. With a real desire to know and a willingness to act, anybody can usually learn a magician's secrets. How do you think they learn them? There's books, YouTube videos, magic stores, websites, that all detail the secrets of most magic tricks and how to do them. You just have to be willing to go and search for them. The knowledge of how to do that trick is special and meaningful to the magician because they had to earn it themselves. They had to work at it. They don't like to just give that knowledge away to indulge apathetic interest. So to get that knowledge yourself, you have to desire enough to act. And sometimes somebody will come up to me afterwards and say, I really want to learn how you do that. Can you give me some direction? And I can often sense the difference in the way that they ask. There's a real desire in them. And I say, are you willing to work for it? And if they say yes, I don't reveal the secret right then, but I tell them where they can go to find out for themselves. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Depends on their level of desire. Well, perhaps in some small way, that's similar to faith. God's knowledge is special, and he wants it to be meaningful and for us to desire it enough to learn for ourselves. Like Joseph said following his experience in the sacred grove, I have learned for myself. But that journey of his required time, effort, desire, and a belief that he could find the truth. And that search is what made the experience so meaningful for him. Joseph would later teach that faith is a principle of action and power. Next question. Why does God call witnesses to see? Well, there's a principle here established by the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 13.1 In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. 
God wants to give us every reason to believe while still requiring faith. In the case of the gold plates, he first calls the three witnesses, Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer. In section 17, God promises them that they will have the plates shown unto them, but that they're going to have to have faith first, believe before see. Martin Harris is specifically a good example of this. We know he's a very physical, evidence-oriented kind of person. He wants to show the manuscript to his friends and family. He begs for Joseph to show him the plates back in section 5. He's taking the characters to the professors back east to confirm their validity. He wants to see before he believes. That's probably when it finally comes down to the moment when the three witnesses are going to be shown the plates. But Martin is still continuing to struggle with this faith. Moroni doesn't appear while he's present. It's not until he leaves that David and Oliver see the plates. And as a teacher, you may want to relate that story to them. A really good, concise description of it is found in Saints, Volume 1, Chapter 7. I won't go through that whole story here, but I'll provide a handout of it along with some other noteworthy quotes regarding the story. Eventually, all three will see the plates. Joseph later goes to find Martin and finds him praying. And he joins him, and shortly thereafter, Martin has the same experience. They all receive that witness. But not only that, they also see Moroni and hear his voice and each of the other sacred objects as well. Their belief led to seeing. And I believe that this process works for all of us as well. The witnesses will come. We don't have to operate only by belief forever. Now, that witness can come through the Holy Ghost. That witness comes to your mind and heart. That witness can come through spiritual experiences and miracles. And indeed, at some point in the future, I believe that we too will get to meet Moroni and see the plates one day. He basically promised us that back in Moroni chapter 10. Until then, we do have the testimony of these three witnesses. And later, eight more are going to see the plates. And we could include Mary Whitmer's witness as well. How nice is it that God has given us that kind of evidence as well? The kind that a lot of us like. Eyewitnesses. Thirteen of them. That's a pretty strong case for the reality. And none of those witnesses will ever deny their experience, even though a number of them will withdraw from the church. I also love Joseph Smith's reaction after the plates are shown to the three witnesses. His mother described what happened like this. When Joseph came in, he threw himself down beside me and exclaimed, Father, mother, you do not know how happy I am. The Lord has caused the plates to be shown to three more besides me. They have also seen an angel and will have to testify to the truth of what I've said. For they know for themselves that I do not go about to deceive the people. I do feel as though I was relieved of a dreadful burden which was almost too much for me to endure. But they will now have to bear a part. And it does rejoice my soul that I am not any longer to be entirely alone in the world gives you a sense of what Joseph's life must have been like all those years. It wasn't like Joseph was selfishly guarding the plates from others because he was the chosen one. He wanted to show people. Of course he did. He wanted to prove that he wasn't a fraud. It just goes to show that sometimes it isn't easy to stand alone in your witness. It's always comforting to have other witnesses join you in that testimony, which leads us to our third step testifying. Why is testifying important? I'll let Paul answer that question. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We kindle faith in others and keep the flames of our own faith burning bright when we express our witness. Why else would we have fast and testimony meeting once a month? Faith is kindled by hearing from those that have faith. It starts the whole process over with another individual. And I believe that God is much more willing to give you a witness if he knows that you will share it with others. So if you want greater testimonies, let the Lord know that if he gives it to you, you will act on it and bear it and share it in word and deed. And I believe that he is much more likely to give it to you. So to summarize the truths here, Faith 
comes before the witness. If I believe, then I will see. And once I have witnessed, I must testify. And a question to help us liken the scriptures. When have you experienced the power of believing, seeing, or testifying? And let a few share their experiences. Then I like to end the lesson with this activity. I ask them if they would like to become witnesses of the truth of my initial statement about cutting the hole in the piece of paper. But they must believe me first before I can show them. And anyone who doesn't believe is invited to leave. And nobody ever leaves, of course. And here's how you do it. To save time, I usually have another piece of paper the same size that's already pre-cut. But this is how you do it. Start by folding the paper in half and then cut two slits from the center down towards the bottom on the edges. But stop before reaching the end. Don't cut all the way through. Then alternate cuts from the top and bottom, being careful not to cut too close to the edge. Effectively cutting the paper into thin strips. And the final cut involves cutting through the middle or the center of the paper, but not the two ends. Be sure you don't get the two ends. You can then pull the paper open to reveal a large hole. Do it carefully so it doesn't rip. And if you've cut it thin enough, it should be plenty big for you to fit your body through. And then you can say, see, sometimes there are things out there that seem incredible or impossible. Things like angels and gold plates and revelation. But that doesn't mean they can't be true or real. Sometimes you just have to hang on and have faith until the witness comes. And I would like to bear my witness to you. I believe in the reality of the gold plates. I believe in the reality of the angel Moroni. I believe in the reality of Joseph Smith's divine prophetic calling to translate the Book of Mormon. That witness has come to me in many different ways. However, I've never seen the plates themselves or Moroni, but I do believe that one day I will. And I'm not going to lie, I think that's going to be really cool. But I don't believe that my witness will be any stronger then than it is now. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to spend this time with you. If you're interested in the slide presentation that I used or the handouts that I made, or you'd like a lesson plan that follows what we talked about, go to teachingwithpower.com and you're going to find links to each of those resources. If you found the lesson helpful, subscribe, hit like, make a comment, share it with those that you feel it could help. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.